thanks everybody uh, for hearing me out today. Um, I wanted to first say that, um, as was mentioned, my expertise is not at all in gender studies or, or gender issues in dermatology. Um, and I'm actually, uh, my expertise is in antimicrobial proteins and I'll be giving a poster later in the week on my actual expertise. But I am a woman and a mother and a scientist. And I've had the distinct pleasure of being uh, the 2000, 2017 US fellow um, for women dermatological um, science this past year, which awarded me the ability to go to SID and meet with a lot of leadership there, and also to attend this meeting as well. Uh, I also participated in, a, in a, uh, some writing and reflection pieces, which allowed me to delve into this area a little bit more. And I'll briefly, in the next 10-15 uh, minutes, share with you guys some of those findings. Um, I, I wanted to also say that I'm like a remarkably, I think, optimistic person. And delving into some of this has been a little bit of a downer um, in that it's hard to look at the data um, and think about some of the hurdles that exist. So my major take home, regardless of what I present, is that I want you guys to be hopeful, optimistic, and persevering. There's no challenge that's presented today that's insurmountable, as all of the uh, female scientists and male scientists um, can attest to. Science is just challenging. So there's all always challenging, um, but our goal is to come up with ways to get around them. Um, and so the, there's some things to be really excited about, about being a woman in science at this moment. And one is that, um, and, you know, if you think about a glass ceiling, that has certainly been shattered, at least in the U.S., uh, for skin science. We have leadership, uh, a lot of female leadership across dermatology, at least in the United States. Um, and at this past SID, that was particularly notable with Dr. Cristiano um, finishing her tenure at the SID. We had Dr. Pentland as well finishing her tenure. Dr. Gilchrist was finishing her uh, five-year tenure as the editor of the JID. Um, Dr. Powler was the recipient of a, a large uh, um, uh, lectureship at the um, SID, and she has um, expertise um, that's, that's renowned and is also a chair of a department, um, as many of these women are um, across dermatology in the United States. We also have significant leadership in societies such as the Medical Dermatological Society. And then there were lots of younger women coming in, giving plenary sessions at the SID as well, like uh, Nurashana Anandapathy, um, uh, Dr. Miller and um, Amy Payne. Um, all of these women um, make me feel like SID is a home for me, a place where I can easily converse and, and, and feel at home. However, there, when I started delving into the data, there are some things that we should be concerned about and that we should keep pushing forward because it, it has implications for us as a field if we don't take action or keep going. Um, and and uh, I'm not sure if the dynamics are the same in Europe, but in the United States, more than 50% of the residents coming into um, dermatology are women. So we have a huge amount of, you know, the pipeline's flowing at that level. We have lots of women coming into our field. And in America, it's a very competitive field. So these are highly skilled women, did very well in medical school. In the setting of a competitive match, most likely they also engaged in, in, in academic endeavors before they came to residency. So they should be primed and ready to go for careers in academia. This should not be an easy task to get them from the step of medical school um, to residency and then on to careers in basic science. This should not be an issue. But when you start looking at the data, we're not getting as many women as you would imagine into basic science tracks in academic fields. Um, so we're getting to parity with women uh, entering faculty positions in the United States, but there's still big gaps in pay, and actually physicians in America out, across fields um, still have a significant pay gap. Um, we have a big gap in promotion and the timing of promotion. Startup packages, actually, I was shocked to learn that startup packages were um, had such a big discrepancy between male and female scientists. This is particularly true for PhDs, um, where male and female PhD scientists have quite a big gap. Um, and then it's also true that women are not getting as many NIH grants as men are um, in dermatology and in other fields. And so I'm, I've been trying to come, you know, think about this within our field, but also maybe come, look outside at, at this as a larger issue of STEM, um, you know, science, technology, engineering, and math, and how those fields can sometimes be, uh, you know, create barriers for women that, and, and, and ways in which identifying the barriers can allow us to, you know, push through them. Um, and this was a big study that was done, done by uh, Joan Williams and, um, and colleagues, and this is a summary of the data in, um, for Harvard Business Review. 
And they identified kind of five patterns that were pushing women out of, out of um, science fields. And I think it's particularly salient because we have lots of women in dermatology, but how do we get them into science, basic science, translational science? Um, and then one of them is this major feeling amongst women. So this was actually survey and interview data. So this was asking, you know, 557 women, a large group of women who were in science, what were some of the barriers that they felt that they had in engaging in this field. And one was this prove it again uh, uh, feeling, that they had to prove their competence over and over again, that their, that their successes were discounted and their expertise was questioned. And I think we can just, you know, I think we have to know that that exists and start to reframe how we think about scientists. You know, when you close your eyes and say, I'm looking at a scientist in my mind, who that scientist look, looks like, and not ask women to have to prove prove that they are, are, are welcome at the table and are experts in their field. Um, the second is the tightrope. Um, I think this definitely uh, is something that, that women often experience, which is that um, in order to um, be seen as competent, they have to sometimes behave in aggressive, uh, prototypically masculine ways, um, which can also often have detrimental effects in their likability. So women seem like they have two options. They can be likable, seen as likable, or seen as competent, but it's very hard to do both, and they feel like they're walking this tightrope between those two, um, those two lines. And um, this was what women were self-reporting as a major issue and a challenge for them in, in, in the science workplace. Um, the next one, and I think uh, many of us have probably gone through this to some degree, um, though I have to say my kids are now um, eight and five. It's, it's unbelievable how quickly you forget that this was ever a challenge. So really persevere, because once you get through, you'll just forget that this was ever a barrier. Um, just keep pushing through. Um, but when I remember, this was certainly a barrier, which is that you, you all of a sudden, you're very privately a person, and then, and then suddenly you're very publicly carrying another human in your, in your body, and, 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 and people change the way that they see you. Um, your commitment and competence are questions, and sometimes opportunities can certainly dry up. Um, and I do think you have to push through. Um, I, I think it sometimes, you know, I realize too, it's beneficial for me that I changed the institution because um, no one knew that I had had children. Um, people would find out two years later, they're like, Dr. Harris, you have children. I'm like, oh yeah, I thought everyone knew. But in my old institution, even the security guards knew that my kids were two and four because they'd seen me carrying them around uh, when I was pregnant. Um, so I think it's something we have to be aware of that, that uh, you know, th that there might be this wall and that you have to find allies and a support system to allow you to push through that wall uh, where, where it is a very busy time of life for both fathers and mothers when children are young, but then it's, it's not supposed to be a permanent barrier for going into science. Um, and then this one, which I, is interesting and I think um, is, is worthy of discussion for sure, which is this kind of tug of war between um, older women who have pushed through and established themselves and, and maybe had to go through hell to get there um, and maybe aren't as, um, you know, there, there's, it can seem that there's a, some antagonism between the success that they've been able to achieve even in hostile waters and a new set of younger uh, uh, female scientists and, 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 and is, are they allies or is there a bit of antagonism there? Um, and I think it, it might have to do with numbers, in my opinion. If we, if we have enough people, that won't be as much of an issue. But if you're the only one who succeeded in the last 20 years, you might not be, you know, you might not have the wherewithal to, you know, throw a rope to the 50 people behind you who need your help. Um, so the, this was another major pattern that was identified. Um, and the last pattern, um, uh, the, the survey, this, they actually did very good demographic data, so they had a lot of data on, um, this is all uh, from American scientists, um, so they were able to stratify the data based on ethnicity, um, and this pattern was particularly um, salient for black women. Um, and they felt there was a larger feeling within that group of being isolated within science. Um, this was also seen for, for women, for a subset of women in the, in the larger group. Um, but I think it was, uh, how much did it say? 42% of black women felt that they were not able to socially engage and that they were often, often felt that they were not being included in larger social functions. So feelings of isolation were a large theme um, throughout this survey that were done. So in conclusion, I, you know, um, 
we are, we're, we're, we're entering dermatology. Lots of women in the U.S. are coming into dermatology, but we're not, the, that next push, that next phase is where we're not getting as many people to make the choice to go into science. So I think if we can address some of these biases, encouraging people to go into science, that can be a, a huge way that we can make improvements. And I think we have to acknowledge that there's bias in our field in science. Um, I, I don't think that does us, um, I don't think it does us any good to ignore it. Um, I think we have to start studying the problem and, and start asking these questions within our subset of population. This was large data. These were all sorts of scientists in or all sorts of fields. Is it possible that we can start asking these questions in a more detailed way for um, um, women in skin science and trying to parse out what are the dynamics that lead people not to stay in um, basic science? We can develop objective metrics of if we're succeeding or not, and then come up with ways. You know, I, um, this same author has come up with uh, what she calls bias interrupters. So these are small actions that you can take that can interrupt these dynamics like blinding applications that actually has been shown to be very successful. So you know you don't know if it's a man or a woman who you're interviewing um, and this was actually for um, technician positions and postdoctoral positions and that alone was able to close a significant amount of the, of the, of the, of the gap in qualified women not being asked to interview because of these inherent biases. Um, so that's like a bias interrupter that might we you know we might be able to um, enact um, if needed, and um, so. So those are my major points. I think my major takeaway is none of these barriers are insurmountable. There's lots of evidence in this room and everywhere else and across the country and the world of women succeeding in science, but um, we've got to keep pushing. And uh, the last thing I did want to say, too, is if you think about it, at least within the U.S., if more than 50 percent of the, uh, of the residents are, um, are women and we're not capturing them, it means we're not capturing dermatologists into science. And so it's, you know, even if you take it outside of the gender issues, we have to do a better job at the pipeline. And if the majority of the pipeline is female, then we have to do a better job with women coming into science because they are the majority of, of, the, of, of the field. Um, and that's it, and I'll take any questions or comments.